This is Catherine Getsky, host of the Hope Matrix podcast. We are here to share science, stories, and strategies for how to hope. I'm the chief hope officer of the Shine Hope Company, and Shine is the mnemonic for how we teach hope. So when we talk about hope, we talk about how we use stress skills, happiness habits, inspired actions, nourishing networks, and eliminating challenges, which are our thinking patterns that get in the way of our ability to hope. Hope is a skill. You can measure hope, you can teach hope, and you can start practicing skills to activate higher hope in your life today. And on this Hope Matrix podcast, we aim to bring in guests, experts in science, people with stories, and those that have strategies for activating hope in your life. Well, hello, listeners. This is Katherine Getsky, host of the Hope Matrix podcast. Thank you so much for listening in today, where we share science stories and strategies for hope. I am here today with Kara Byrne. She is with Green Our Planet out of Las Vegas, Nevada, good old Las Vegas. And we're really excited to hear uh, have, have Kara here today and share more about her story and journey and the work. She's actually doing a lot of work in Vegas um, with us around hope, and we're really excited and grateful for that. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I am delighted to be here. Yes, well, pretty amazing. And and I was reading your bio and so impressed. I have to dive right into this one. Um, an Obama fellow. So yeah. that is pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So can you tell tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, sure. Yeah. So um Back in 2018, it was actually a friend of mine told me that um, the Obama Foundation was looking for applicants for their fellowship program. And what they were looking for was um, nonprofit leaders who were doing programs in their communities that were working and that were ready to scale um, across the country. And so uh, I would just said to her, oh, I'm, I'm not going to apply for that because like thousands of people will be applying. What's the point? But it was interesting because she she texts she emailed me and she texted me twice and I have this rule that if somebody or a few people like three ask me to do something or if I hear about a book three times you know it's the universe tapping you on the shoulder yeah. so I was like oh okay okay and I'm not joking it was due the application was due at like 5 p.m. on let's say a Thursday and at like 3:30 I start doing it and filling it out with great haste. And like, there's 10 minutes to go and you have to submit like a short video. And I have my assistant, Catherine, I was like, okay, quick, quick, I've got to do this video. <laughs> anyway, and so, and they received um, applications from 5,000 nonprofit leaders from around the world. And then they picked 20 to be in the fellowship program. And I was lucky enough to be one of the 20. So. Oh yeah. my gosh, that's yeah. incredible. Well, we'll get more into what that means, but I mean, and I did kind of jump ahead. Um, you know, what, tell us more about your organization and what got you to that point, really. I mean, when you look at all you've done, I say, of course, you're going to be an Obama fellow. Oh. But, but yeah, if you can share with our listeners just a little bit more, you know, about what Green Our Planet even is. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. And I will tie it back into hope and to, into your mission, which essentially is, you know, when I was growing up, I really struggled with anxiety and depression. And my way through that and, you know, what helped me manage it was being in nature. So every cell in my body knows that connecting with trees and the planet and birds and butterflies and all the things just is really good for humans, for our mental health, for our happiness, joy, and especially for hope. Mm -hmm. And so... um uh, yeah, so I'm, I mean, I'm a filmmaker by background. I worked in film for over 20 years with my partner, Kim. And um, both he and I made films all over the world for Discovery Channel and PBS and the BBC. And I run a film company with offices in New York and LA. We made about 60 to 80 hours of TV every year. But, you know, we were always trying to get films made that were, wouldn't be funded, like about um, the extinction happening on the planet, about conservation, about all these things. And then we realized, you know, maybe we need to do something a bit different, right? To 
we've been in film 20 years and that's actually how we ended up starting green our planet we were working on a film in africa with the amazing conservationist dr richard linky he's also a paleoanthropologist and he has since passed but he was a huge inspiration to us you know we were making a film about the sixth extinction and how um you know so many species are going extinct every year unfortunately and we were asking ourselves the question, well, how, how can we change that? And how can we show humans that our connection to the planet is so worth it for us? Like it returns us to who we are. And I firmly believe that a lot of our mental health issues and stress and anxiety comes from the detachment and the lack of connection that we have with the planet. Because like we are part of nature, but we pretend we're not. <laughs> so anyway, so we were chatting about it with him about this. And we were all saying, you know, we really need to figure out a way where everyone can become connected to the planet and care about it and essentially be a conservationist. And then school gardens. And we figured, oh, that's the way. So by connecting students to the planet when they're young, our goal is hopefully they'll fall in love with it. And if you fall in love with it and build a connection, then you won't want to destroy it. So that's kind of how the whole thing started. But it yeah. comes out of managing my management of my stress anxiety and my human experience yeah yeah i often say so much innovation comes out of our pain you know and when we explore our pain instead of running from it and really look into what you know what's our sadness or fear or anger about and how do we dive into it and how do we help manage it in healthier ways i mean there's so much science now thankfully that shows that gardening you know, boost dopamine and serotonin and these feel good chemicals that we need, that we need. It's a great way to alleviate stress. That's actually why we chose the sunflower as the international symbol of hope, you know, because of all of the benefits associated with gardening, not to mention the nutrition that you get from eating these healthy things. Sick. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit more then about Green Our Planet, like what you're doing right now. Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. So, Essentially, we started in one school garden here in Las Vegas. We helped get it funded and then built. And today we're in about 1,100 schools across the United States and 42 states. Um, almost 500 of them are across Nevada. So the, the bulk of them right now are in Nevada. But uh, we're expanding rapidly across the country. And um, what we help schools with essentially is installing an outdoor garden and or hydroponics lavatory, so that's indoor farming. And then we provide everything that teachers could possibly need to make a successful program. So we provide the curriculum and every lesson has a video. So for STEM, conservation, nutrition, all of the lessons we provide on our portal. Teachers go on to our portal, they access all our programming, they attend webinars, they connect with each other and they share ideas and failures, you know, because they learn from their failures, obviously. And so we provide everything, everything they could need. And then we also ship hydroponic systems, you know, around the world. We're working in Dubai. We're soon to work in Ireland. We work a lot in the Arctic Circle with all the schools there, actually, because it's hard to grow food outside in the Arctic Circle and so on. So we are the kind of one-stop shopping for teachers who want to engage the students and get them excited about teaching STEM, nutrition, conservation, social emotional learning using nature. Yeah. Wow, 1100 schools. That is yeah. amazing. That's yeah, that's incredible. As students, which is yeah. awesome. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. And I like what you said too about young. I mean, when we started figuring out how to teach hope, we started with seven to 11 year olds, because if you can get them young, it kind of becomes who they are. Like, yeah. Same with gardening, and I can imagine, and taking care of the earth and, and you know, growing things and, and caring about that. If you can get them learning how to do that at a young age, then it just becomes second nature to them. Whereas when you try to teach them in their 30s or 40s, it can be more challenging because we're so set in our ways already. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. We have another thing in common, which is pretty cool. So I worked with Katie Leakey. Um, and our Zulu grass in Africa. Um, so yes, maybe 20 years ago. Um, she's, I think it's, um, she was married to Phil, I think, uh, oh, okay. brother. Yeah. Brother. Yep. Yeah, exactly. 
So yeah, small. I studied wildlife management before I got into Hope. <laughs> so <laughs> such a jump, but yeah, so love all of the work that you're doing. It's incredible. So yeah, I mean, and and kind of how we run. I mean, it's it's amazing. I, I don't know what y- you want to dive into here, but when we go and we when we start talking about Hope, our goal is to really normalize the conversation around hopelessness. Being both emotional despair, so you feel sad or angry, um, afraid, fear, kind of the three common emotions, and motivational helplessness, you feel powerless to do anything about it. And when I dove into the research around hopelessness being the single consistent predictor of suicide, also a key predictor of violence um, and addiction, and kind of the primary symptom of anxiety and depression, I thought, why don't I know what hopelessness is and how to manage it and get to hope? And that's how I started on that journey to figure out how you teach hope. And we came up with the SHINE framework. And, you know, when we go through any kind of challenge in life, our moments of hopelessness will go up. So we can have a moment like getting cut off in traffic. We may feel a moment of hopelessness or, you know, there's a lot of talk right now, um, obviously about this pervasive sense of hopelessness about the environment and climate change and global warming. And so, you know, we, we tackle it from a lot of different angles, but when I have guests on, I love to talk to them about a specific challenge they have or have had and, and go through the shine framework. So we kind of teach while we talk about hope and share stories and strategies for how we navigate our challenges. So I would love to talk to you today about any challenge you may want to talk about um, or a story that you want to share with us. Well, I have a uh, cornucopia you can choose from. I have when I was a kid struggling with anxiety and depression. I have more recently, this time last year, I found out that I had breast cancer and I'm just kind of finishing my breast cancer journey. So there's that. Wow. Or there's all the variety of hopeless moments running creep back planet. So I could Gosh. any of those. I don't know which. Well, I mean, yeah, thank you. I mean, they all are super important and we can learn from all of them. I think, I, I mean, I would love to learn more because I know this is, you know, a major challenge and I know a lot of women that have gone through it and I haven't yeah. had this conversation. So I would love if you're open to it. Only. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to talk more about your experience and your diagnosis and kind of what happened. And, and especially as a female business entrepreneur, um, you know, managing all of that. Yeah, I would love if you would if yes, you would share more about that. Yeah, really amazing. So, okay. yeah, go ahead. Why don't we? How right. So on July 17th, 2023, I found out that I had breast cancer. And the way that I found out, my doctor i'd had a biopsy and my doctor's assistant called me to set up an appointment but it wasn't for nine days and i knew that if you have a biopsy and you have to have a doctor's appointment it means that the news is not cut Mm. so i actually went into the portal where you have results and i found out myself Mm. so i know so i read you know stage two breast cancer you know it's spread to your lymph nodes all the things and i didn't really understand it and so i called my brother uh, who happens to be a doctor, and he was in Dublin. Luckily, they're eight hours ahead, but he happened to be up. And I think that was the beginning of the lucky part of my cancer journey, in that instead of having a doctor who doesn't know me explain what this journey was going to be, I have my brother who knew me quite well. So, you know, I, I sent the results to him, and he said, listen, he said, yes, you have breast cancer, and the next year is not going to be pleasant. It's going to be rough. But he said, I know you and I know that you're going to be able to get through this. And then he said, I think what the words which stuck to me are kind of stayed with me the whole journey, which was you have done harder things. And I was like, oh, OK. So, you know, nobody wants to hear the words you cancer. Right. And especially that it had spread to my lymph nodes. And knowing that I'd have to go through chemo and radiation and surgery and all the things. Um, so it wasn't like, I'm not saying I wasn't devastated. I was, but I felt in that moment that he said those words was like the seed of hope, you know, in that this isn't going to be something insurmountable. 
And I've often thought about that conversation since because, you know, it was a long journey. It was a year. I literally just finished. And Congratulations. Oh, thank you. And today I have my first scan after this conversation. Wow. That we're having this conversation. All right, and, right. Yeah, but I'm sure divine intervention and all the things. Yeah. But what's interesting is, you know, going through surgery and then going through chemo, which honestly was probably the most brutal hard part of it and then radiation i kept thinking back to the framework that my brother had given me in in terms of like you can do this you've done harder things and i wondered what it would have been like if i had gone to the doctor who you know who doesn't know me and who would have just said hey you know you need to do surgery you need to do this and this is the path like they wouldn't have said anything like that and i think it really struck me that challenging things happen to all of us all the time and we do get to choose how we frame them and that was a really good example of that for me like I didn't frame it my brother did but I really took that on board and right from the beginning I was like yep yeah, I'm gonna get through this there will be hard days but I'm gonna be fine and I think you know because there were days when I woke up when I wasn't fine, right? Or the 20 hours that I'm lying on the sofa after chemo and just you're in this weird netherland and, you know, you just feel the life force seeping from you. Like they were really tough days. And on those days, you literally hold grasp onto that framework really tightly. You have to, right? Because it's so easy to descend into hopelessness. And and there are and there is hopelessness. You're in it, yeah, and you're right. not right. It's you're there, yeah. and you're just recognizing that you're not going to stay there. Exactly. So, yeah. So I think, um, and I've shared this story with my team because I felt it was such a powerful lesson for me. Is that we can't really control so many things like getting in a car accident, getting cancer, you know. Um, losing your job or whatever. A lot of those things, you know, you can feel powerless, but ultimately you do have the power to decide how you react to them, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so that was crucial. Yeah. Wow. So it's kind of, it's incredible. Um, you may not even know this, um, but one of the things we do is have kids, and one of the things you're have you're helping us do is have all the kids write their shine hope story, mm. where they talk about a challenge that they've had in the past, and then they go through this specific shine framework to share how they navigated that challenge, because that is exactly what we know about hope. That if you can go, th if you're going through a challenging time and can reflect back on another time that you were able to navigate it, able to get through it and come out the other side, that can give you strength to get through the current challenge. So it's pretty, pretty incredible that your brother had that, you know, intuitive knowing and insight. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and so important to know that it's, you know, hope isn't about not feeling hopelessness it's like we feel despair and helpless of course you felt despair and helpless i mean you think about those days of course you do it's about knowing how to navigate those those moments even if it means just getting through them not doing anything just you know waiting until that despair passes so you can get to the other side back to hope and you know that's one of the things we talk about with hopeless and hope and hopelessness is hope is a journey and it's a constant you've got to constantly be using your muscles to get towards hope and it's you know hopelessness is the normal part of life and mm -hmm. and it's just how do we manage that in healthier ways really 100 percent. and you said earlier that um in our pain that we can often find wisdom and you know, ways for figuring out how to overcome certain challenges. And it's interesting because just in the last few weeks, especially, I've been journaling a lot about, you know, the journey because it's, you know, I guess phase one is concluding. Um, and I've been thinking about, you know, wh what is the, what are the lessons 
how was my life enriched by the the journey? There were a lot of things. Um, I think one of the main things that I didn't expect was that in the darkest moments when, you know, I described like I, um, downstairs, we have this kind of old beat up sofa that we've had for years, but it's very, it's like your comfortable blanket, you know, with those sofas. And that's where I would lie after chemo for days at a time, just like zonked. And what was fascinating about that experience was that losing your life force, or in that case, I lost my life force at times like you, like I couldn't even make a cup of tea. I couldn't take a shower. I, I couldn't even watch TV. Like I just felt so out of it. Um, made me appreciate my life force, you know, um, because I've always moved at a hundred miles an hour. I'm very active, you know, um, but I'm not sure that I really appreciated that energy and that life force. And then I started thinking about the fact, you know, that beyond our planet, for all of the um, exploration that we have done, we haven't found a life force beyond our planet. You know, we've been looking, if we found microbes up on Mars, there would be great excitement. And so I talked to the, our team last week and I was sharing with them about this idea. And it's because you've got the sunflower. I had this idea that there are no sunflowers in the stars. There's no life force beyond our planet that we have discovered and we may be alone in the universe. And so this life force that was seeping away from me, and I could feel it literally leaving my body and going into the ether, that it is such a massive gift and such a, um, we're, we're almost a statistical impossibility given the billions of galaxies and the trillions of planets and even with the Hubble Space Telescope or the Webb Space Telescope that we can look back through time and we still haven't found any life on other planets, we may, but as of right now, we haven't. And so I felt even deeper appreciation for the planet than I've ever had. And yeah, and it, it kind of reconfirmed my life's journey, which is green our planet, <laughs> and protecting the planet and all the other life forces on it. Um, yeah, so wow, that was a gift from cancer. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. We talk about those in our happiness habits. That intentional experience of wonder and awe, mm. like really starting to feel into those. And we take so much for granted. Things become so just, you know, normal to us. So sitting back and really thinking about like getting in an airplane, you know, many people get nervous, but you know, what if we transition that to, oh my gosh, you know, I'm flying in the air and isn't this amazing and magical? Yeah. So back to your journey. Um, what, how did you manage the stress, like, of it, the sadness, the rage, the fear? Like, what practically did you do? Um, so a few things. I think the first thing that you realize you need to decide, and I obviously didn't know this how I got cancer, is you have to decide who you're going to invite on the journey with you. So, you know, some people want to keep it very private like they don't want to talk about the fact they have cancer and all the things that go with that other people start blogs <laughs> and they want to tell everybody <laughs> right. um and i was in the middle like it wasn't like you know i was blogging about it or putting it on social media or anything but i decided that i really wanted to have my community join me on the journey because i didn't want to do it alone and, um, you know, I'd done other hard things, including Green Our Planet and setting it up and running it, that I, where I think I felt resilience was about doing the hard thing and really getting through it. But what this journey allowed me to realize was that resilience is really recognizing you have a community and that they can help you. And so you don't have to do all the hard things yourself. So that was very powerful for me. You know, I really felt encouraged getting texts and emails and 
friends bring you over meals and you know zoom calls and whatever you like all the things mm -hmm. my family and my brother and his um partner were super helpful because they're both doctors so they were really helpful so letting the community in really helped me a lot and so what would you say to someone that, that's potentially listening to that feels alone in this that doesn't feel like they have great community or connections to support them any insights for how they might reach out or what they might yeah so the other thing that's quite amazing is that there are so many groups that you can join right that you know where there's people who've had cancer and you've made it to the other side and you can i mean everything from facebook groups to the um cancer center where i went has groups to i mean there's a lot and then you can kind of choose the one that suits you best meaning it could be pretty anonymous. It could be just like writing in a Facebook group, or it could be in person. Um, I went to Cedar sinai and they had, you know, meetings where you'd actually go and meet other people if you prefer that. So depending on your comfort level, I think there's, yeah. And then the American Cancer Society has all kinds of programs and ways of, you know, people you can connect to that are extraordinarily helpful. So yeah, it's amazing. I know. And it's when we go through hard times, I mean, it's in my nature to hide from the world, you know, to, and yet it's so important that we connect. Yeah. And so it's being aware of, for me, my, like that I do that and that being intentional about connecting when I am going through challenges with people that can support me. And you can bring up a great point. I mean, you don't have to do it face to face. You can do it in words, um, in groups, anonymously, you know, and yet still it's so important that we connect and reach out to others. It's it's so important for our, our health, our mental health, our hope, really. I think so too. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, it's not the kind of burden, it's not the kind of burden you have to carry alone. Like if you are willing to open up there are groups there for you, no matter what way you like to connect. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then we talk about the H happiness habits, which may seem very challenged, like impossible during this time. So, but when we talk about it, we have so many stress hormones circulating through our body when we go through challenges and we need to counteract them, as I like to say, with happiness hormones, dopamine, serotonin. And, and how do you get them when you're going through that? I mean, yeah, that's um, legitimate. <laughs> it's a challenge, but not impossible. Um, obviously, everybody gets them in different ways. But for me, I loved just sitting and we have like we live in Vegas. So our garden is very small and there's no grass. It's just trees, a few trees and some flowers and stuff. But just sitting in the garden and looking at the birds and the butterflies, I just feel that was so healing. Mm. It brought deep happiness. And so that's, and that's easy. Like you can walk out and sit down and, or go for a walk in the neighborhood. And some days I couldn't even walk. So that was challenging, but I could sit in the garden on any given day. So that was really powerful. And then on the days that I felt decent, I definitely, I have a morning ritual like that I like to do and that's journaling for about 30 minutes or three pages. And then I like to, I usually have a, some kind of positive book on the go, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, I just finished a book called the gap in the gain, which is all about living in the gain. And, you know, I'd read it and write down some quotes. And then the third part of my morning ritual is meditating for like 15 minutes. So if I'm able to do all that in an hour, that really sets me up for a good day, no matter, no matter the challenge. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So important. Yeah. And, you know, when we go through challenges, we may not want to do that stuff, you know, it's like we yeah. don't. And then we get into this cycle of, you know, and so it's even... Like getting someone to help you, to keep you accountable, to keep doing those things can be helpful. Um, yeah, that's amazing. What about nutrition? What was food like? Were you 
be able to yeah. so um i don't eat meat so you know that can be challenging because you have to eat a lot of protein um when you're going through cancer treatment but i um took protein uh shakes with the plant protein and um yeah i think nutrition is crucial because it can set off the wrong feelings in your body right it's like you put bad gas in your car tank and it doesn't run very well so same with our bodies if we don't put in good food sources you know and healthy food we're not gonna be able to perform very well ourselves so i've always been a big proponent of healthy nutrition um Yes, I mean, I love eating oatmeal and I always add in fruit and yogurt for protein. And that actually turns out to be, and the gluten-free oatmeal turns into like a high protein breakfast. If you want it to be, it can be up to 30 grams and then protein shakes during the day and then just vegetables and some kind of protein in the evening. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yep. Um, and then looking, you know, when you were diagnosed and it's, you said it's a year? Yep. It's a year. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So did you have a goal? Like did when when we look at did you chunk down? I mean, it can be very overwhelming when you get a diagnosis and then it can, you know, it can spiral spiral you downward. And so setting goals or chunking down goals, did you have any goals that you kind of set when you were diagnosed? Yeah, so um I definitely trying to do gratitude in my journal every day was super helpful. Because I think there are things that you don't anticipate happening, well, at least I didn't. Uh, for example, you don't realize how much time you're going to be on the phone with your health insurance company. No, no. You know, and so when you're feeling really crappy, but you're trying to get yourself good health care. Right. And I think, I don't think this is like, I think my health care insurance is fine. I think it's just a thing because yeah. you've so many treatments and you're going through so much, there's all kinds of things that you need to figure out and so you know those two-hour conversations and you're waiting and holding like they were not fun and so after those I would have to write in my gratitude journal like I'm grateful that I have access to healthcare right kind of like getting in the airplane realizing I have access to really good healthcare it's going to save my life all those things yeah because you do have unanticipated challenges like that yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the tiredness. Yeah. yeah. And did you know you would be done in a year? Did you know the treatments yeah, would I, take? I, I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. tell you that. Timeline. Fairly yeah. Early. Yeah. Um, and we've talked a bit about networks and your the strength of your network, the which is our N. Um, the E, eliminating challenges. Did you worry a lot about the future? I mean, were you and or um Interestingly, you know, another thing that, you know, my brother told me fairly early on, which again was super helpful, was, you know, really visualing, visualizing and feeling myself being healthy. So my goal was anytime I had an anxiety, you know, like, for example, I had um, after my surgery, I had a, um, a complication with my power of my hand and not being able to use my hand properly and so that caused my anxiety but i yeah. just did, every time i would feel like oh my god are we going to get the power of my hand back i would think um i would actually Im- see myself in my mind super healthy like amazingly healthy and i'd feel it like feel it in my body yeah. i feel amazing i feel so healthy i feel and i really think programming your brain like that is mm-hmm. extremely helpful yeah, there are studies now that show it. Actually, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. You know, also with the nocebo effect, if they tell you you're going to have a negative side effect, you know, 50% of the people have that negative side effect, even if they take a sugar pill. Yeah. So, so it's like, you know, it's important to know what the potential side effects may be and then visualize yourself being very healthy you know and not having those as opposed to continually visualizing yourself with those side effects because you know exactly yeah so important wow that's incredible thank you so much you know anything you would share with um anyone going through treatment right now or just diagnosed or so 
I would say to yourself, so I had, I wish I had it still up there. I, I have a board next to me where I now have our, my goals for the quarter. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> but I actually had my cancer mission statement. Mm, nice. And I think it's really helpful because, you know, lying on the sofa, being able to see that was really powerful for me. And it was essentially, it was, you know, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to inspire people through the journey. The best is yet to come, right? Was, that was kind of the essence of it. Yeah. And, you know, I said every day I was programming myself with that. And I did feel like um, it's so incredibly powerful to take on board that this could be the best thing that ever happened to me. Right. So I remember I said to my mom recently, yeah, I think cancer is the best thing that ever happened to me. And she's like, oh my God, don't say that. But I didn't mean it like, oh, I'm so happy I got cancer. I meant that just the actual journey really opened up like this idea to me about, you know, our life force and how incredibly rare and beautiful it is. Right. Um, about being able to take difficult challenges and make them into community journeys right? All, all those kind of things that I learned this year were amazing, amazing. And if I hadn't had cancer, I wouldn't have learned all this. So yeah. 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 That's amazing. Beautiful. And yeah, it, hard for those maybe going through it to hear it and yet also important. And it's like you plant that seed yeah. and then, you know, see what unfolds. So yeah, that's really incredible. Thank you. Um, and I just like saying one more thing, because I do feel very passionate about this because you could feel so bad right now, somebody is listening and they're really going through a bad time. I think owning that is good, but just, even though it could be too hard to say, this is, you know, the best thing that ever happened to me. What if you asked yourself the question, what if this was the best thing? What would that mean? Like just ask, allowing your mind to even contemplate it yeah. and set you on the right path. Absolutely. So that really helped me, like, in my darkest, like, really, you know, crappiest days where you feel like you're never going to... Because it's a long journey, and being sick for a year, like, is a long time. Yeah. And so on the days that you feel like, oh, my God, I'm never going to feel well again, just opening your mind to what if not only am I going to feel so well, but I'm going to have so many other learnings and wisdom and a deeper sense of empathy with people, all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. That is from passion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, living more in the moment, um, for sure. More more appreciation for that. Um, I would like to get back into Green Our Planet just a little bit. Oh, yeah. Because it's, I mean, it's so amazing. What is your vision for Green Our Planet now? So our vision is by 2033 that we'll be working with 10,000 schools in all the states and impacting 5 million students and run our way. Yeah. So that's wow. it. So, and then our giant Incredible. student farmers markets where the students come together in the community and they, they have farmers markets. We have only been doing those in Nevada, in Vegas, and in northern Nevada. But starting in spring... We're going to be expanding those to Salt Lake and then hopefully Richmond and Austin. And then even in 2026, hopefully Dublin. So, wow, that's incredible. That is fantastic. Yeah. I, you know, and I talk to so many people, so many youth that are just, you know, the world is coming to an end. They are giving up. They're not doing anything, you know, climate, climate change. And, and I see, do, you know, start doing something and I look at what you are doing and being part of the solution there's there are so many innovations that are happening right now in the space and to me you bringing gardens to inner city kids to you know youth that wouldn't have the otherwise exposure to it teaching them how to respect and value and grow things mm -hmm. um I have a friend who's out of prison and he's become just he loves his plants he's obsessed with his plants and it's like the first time he's ever really had plants and it's just become this thing you know learning to care for something grow something nurture something it's just so powerful and and so yeah what what's your take on on climate change and what people can do and in, in the outlook so 
I understand why, especially young people, might be feeling hopeless. I feel like um, it's a hard time to grow up, right? There's a lot of political instability. There's a lot of division, especially in our, well, in many countries, including our country. Um, there are wars going on and there is climate change, which is the, uh, as Gard Jameson, who you know. Yes, yeah, Love you, Gard. Yeah, it's the first button on the shirt, right? Because without the planet, there is no humans. <laughs> right. um, so what am I to say about climate change? Well, it's happening. It's real. And we all need to pay attention to it. There is that. I do believe that humans are smart enough to be able to stop it. I choose to be believe yeah. that because if I didn't, I would just give up my job. <laughs> to right, be right, right, and right. Really, what, what I see my job as being is to help with our team to help educate the next generation of conservationists and scientists and engineers who are going to solve the problems that climate change brings. But what the if you if you look at you know you say look into our pain and you find solutions and you find wisdom, well if you look into the pain that climate change is causing us, it is forcing us to live on the planet in a more harmonious way. Yeah. So Thomas Berry talks about this in his book The Great Work, where he says, basically humans have given all the rights on the planet to ourselves. Right? We've excluded other living beings. Yeah. He said, our next great work is to move to a place where humans can coexist in harmony with the planet and with other living beings. Yeah. And I think that's the journey that we're on. And the quicker that we get to that place, the less pain for us and, and the planet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you think about climbing a mountain, to me, sometimes I think of a climate change, like figuring out climate change, like climbing a mountain, but you've got to break down the steps into little tiny steps. And I think with youth, it's like, what can you do today? What proactive, positive step can you do today and stay in the moment and keep doing that? And, and I kind of, I like you bringing up, you know, the collective pain. When I started my work around hope, I got sober at the same time and it wasn't just for me it was yeah. for all the girls around the world that were struggling. So every time I talk, every time I get up to do something, I think about all of them, all you know, and I bring them all with me to the work I'm doing. And I think, you know, there's a lot of collective pain that you can actually tap into and it can give you energy and, and insights um, that, you know, for me, I've not been able to explain a lot of it, but it's been such a gift. So... Yeah. So how can people get involved in, in Green Our Planet? Well, um, our website is greenourplanet.org. So that's easy enough. And you can follow us on social media. If you live in Nevada, attend our farmer's markets, buy the food from the school gardens. The students will be so happy to see you. And yeah, we, we volunteer projects mostly here in Southern Nevada. Um, but in also in the schools where we are across the United States, they always need help in their school gardens and also in their hydroponics laboratory. So, amazing. Yeah. And, then, and the one other thing I'll add before we we get off is that um, I noticed you have an Irish accent. You said you're both oh, in yeah. Ireland. Yeah. So we've done a, Dublin. Okay, we did a lot of our work and starting in Northern Ireland actually. So I've been there quite a bit with the kids doing focus groups. They have added so much to hope science and what we know about hope and what I personally know about hope and our programming and all of that. So it's, um, awesome. yeah, I think Ireland, like a lot of people say to me, I don't like, how come you're so hopeful during this challenging time? And I say, well, I was super lucky. I grew up in Ireland during the seventies, which was the most violent period in Irish history since the, you know, the British, um, colonized Ireland 800 years ago. And so we went through this very brutal, violent 17 years. And then when I was 17 years old in 1997, there was peace, right? They, the peace accord was reached and thanks in part to President Clinton and, you know, many others. But what I saw was I saw a war come to an end that had been raging for 800 years. And it made me realize and gave me so much hope that anything is possible. And so when we look at Ukraine and we look at Israel and Gaza, 
I realize that we can end the wars. Like there is hope for that to happen. And we don't have to buy into everlasting wars at all. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Kara, so much for yeah. joining. It was so wonderful talking to you and learning more about about Greener Planet and you and your journey. And thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing your story. You know, I think it's great, as you said, you know, we can pick from many different things to talk about from experiences of hopelessness because we go through so many challenges in life and, and it's about being proactive about how we manage those challenges and managing them with others as opposed to kind of siloed. Um, and so I'm really grateful that you're helping us bring that to kids as well and teaching kids how to write their Shine Hope stories and um, yeah, plant and tackling one of the biggest challenges of our time um, as it relates to our planet and bringing, bringing green gardens to our youth. So thank you so much and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for all your amazing work and for bringing hope to so many students and communities. Absolutely. And thank you all for listening in uh, the Hope Matrix podcast. Have a wonderful day. So thank you all for listening in to the Hope Matrix podcast. Um, we want to shine a light that hope is teachable, hope is measurable and teachable, and provide you with actionable insights for how you can start activating hope in your life today and provide a framework so you can start talking about hope with other people and practice these skills together because we are better with hope. Please feel free to check out the shinehopecompany.com where we list all of our resources around how to hope. We have a lot of free programs for how to hope, including the five day challenge, our hope infographic with a lot of skills that showcase how to hope and articles of how to incorporate hope into your life. We have the Hope Beat Weekly, which is a weekly newsletter that shares strategies for hope. We have a My Hope Story template, so you can write your own hope story today. Uh, also, My Hope Hero, so we can share what our heroes are doing to activate hope in their lives. And this is especially good with youth. So they can start looking up to people that have overcome similar challenges to them and seeing how these heroes use the Shine Hope framework. We have a Hopeful Minds for Teens program, a Hopeful Minds Overview, Educator Guides. We have a new evidence-based college course so you can activate hope on the college campus. There are programs in the workplace overview courses, 90 minute courses for learning the what, why, and how to hope. What I want you to know about hope is it's a skill. You've got to practice these skills to become hopeful. It's easy to fall into despair and helplessness when we deal with challenges in life, and it takes intentional work and practice to get to hope. And yet it is always possible. So no matter what life brings, keep shining hope. Thanks so much for listening in. Have an awesome day. And of course, I've got to add this, that this program is designed to assist you in learning about hope. It should not be used for medical advice, counseling, or other health-related services. I, Fred, the Shine Hope Company, and myself, Katherine Getsky, do not endorse or provide any medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. I am not a medical doctor. The information provided here should not be used for the di diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition and cannot be substituted for the advice of physicians, licensed professionals, or therapists who are familiar with your specific situation. Consult a licensed medical profession or call 911 if you are in need of immediate assistance. And be sure to know the crisis hotline, 988, if you are in need of support. Thanks a bunch for listening. Take good care of yourself and keep shining hope.